just drifts away and as i look back on the years memories of happiness and bitter tears through it all there was a common thread that cannot be ignored you were there teaching me to be your servant lord all along your hand has been guiding me shaping my life to be a beautiful song all along you've led me through the things that you knew would make me strong your love has been there all along every joy and pain have a reason of its own now i realize that i was not alone the changing seasons of my life were not left up to chance lord i know you were working to fulfill your plans all along your hand has been guiding me shaping my life to be a beautiful song all along you've led me through the things that you knew would make me strong your love has been there all along tomorrow when i turn around and i look back at sure have enjoyed the service thus far, the singing, the presentation, the fellowship, just everything about it. In my heart, I am rejoicing. Um, I just love Jesus. So thankful that I get to be a part of the plan. I hope you know what the plan is. God has a plan, and I'm glad I get to be a part of it. I hope God has revealed to you what your part of the plan is. Very important. God has a plan. He has an overall plan for this time in which we live, but He also has a specific plan for you individually. He has a purpose for you in that plan. And I pray that you will not only know that purpose, but you will fulfill it so that you can have fulfillment in your life. There's a lot of people just wandering aimlessly through life. It's really a terrible way to exist. It's not really living. It's just merely existing. But when you hook in and connect with the plan of the great God of heaven and find your purpose for life, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. It all begins to come into focus, doesn't it? As the song said, the things that we pass through, the things that God allows us to go through, 
we see the hand of God. Sometimes in the midst of it and sometimes when we look back on it, we see the hand of God guiding us along the way. What a wonderful God we serve. What a wonderful God that we serve. Several years ago, I read a gospel track by Dr. Oliver B. Green. Perhaps you know Dr. Oliver Green. He's in heaven now. Uh, he was from my hometown, Greenville, South Carolina, the Gospel Hour. And uh, I, I'll never forget the first time I heard him preach on the radio. Shortly after I was saved, um, I went in, shared and I, uh, I had been working. I got home, and I, I mean, I, I was just so excited. I said, honey, <laughs> I just heard the greatest preaching I've ever heard. I'm going to find out where this man is, and we're going to go visit that church. Well, as I began to ask questions, that wasn't possible because he'd gone on to heaven. <laughs> but uh, what, a, what a preacher Dr. Oliver Green was. Thank God for preaching. Thank God for people who shaped my life with preaching. I read that gospel track. The name of the track, perhaps you read it, was All This in Hell Too. And it was a gospel track calling sinners to repentance calling sinners from sinful lifestyles, from, from the heartache and the sorrow that sinful lifestyle has. Uh, it was calling them from that and warning them that if you think that this is something, you haven't seen anything yet. One day all of hell is going to be unleashed upon this earth. And as I began over the last several months here, I'm fast-forwarding now some 30-something years later, I began to think about how that there's certainly nothing wrong with warning people of hell. As a matter of fact, more people need to be warned that there is a real, literal burning hell and people who die in their sin are going to go there. There's many that have gone, and I'm sorry for that. And there's many more on their way. And we must get the message out. But as I began to think about that, I thought about heaven. And I thought about how so few Christians seem to be excited about going to heaven. I thought about the, the numbers of people that I've talked about through the years, in particular, more recent. And it doesn't seem that very many Christians are excited about going to heaven. Can I tell you this morning, I'm excited about going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. Well, preacher, I hope I make it too. You don't have to hope so. I don't hope I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. Don't, miss, don't mistake what I just said. I didn't say I hope I make it to heaven. I said I'm going there. Amen. You say, what did you do to get to heaven? It's not what I've done. It's what Jesus did. See, I place my faith in what Christ has done. I'm going to heaven, brethren. And I'm excited about it. I'm excited about going to heaven. You know, if we could get some Christians to, to read up on heaven and get excited about going to heaven, I believe there's some people that might want to come and go with us. Say amen with me. You ever, you ever been around somebody and they get to talking about where they're going on vacation and you just get to thinking in the back of your mind, I'm jealous, I want to go there too, amen? <laughs> huh? You know what I'm talking about? You get around folks and they get to talk about the beautiful scenery of a place where they're going and you're thinking, man, my vacation, you know, it, it, it's months away. I, I'd like to kind of go with y'all. I hope they invite me. <laughs> right? They get to talk about how beautiful a place is and, and relaxing and all the things about the place they're going to visit. Well, you know, when I think of heaven, that's what it does to me. When I begin to read in God's Word about this place called heaven, it just, it causes a longing in my soul to go there. And so I talked to you a few weeks back, and we talked about heaven a little bit out of John 14. We talked about three things about heaven. Number one, it's a real place. Jesus called it a place. He said, listen, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. Heaven's a real place, brethren. It's not some figment of our imagination. It's real. And number two, not only is it a real place, it's a remarkable place. Amen. It was so remarkable. Thomas said, hey, he said, I don't know how to get there. I need to know. Amen. Jesus said, and where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said, we don't know. <laughs> and Lord, we don't know. Tell us. Tell us how to get there. It's remarkable. And it's not only real and remarkable, we've talked about out of John 14, it's reserved. Not everyone's going there. Jesus, listen, he said, I'm the way. There's only one way to get to this place. And he said, I am the way the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Well, I want to talk with you about heaven again this morning. 
I have three questions about heaven. Actually, I have more that I'll be looking into and delving into in our Sunday morning services. But there's three this morning that I want to answer. Three questions about heaven. What do you know about heaven? You know, I'm convinced that if we knew more about heaven, there'd be more people just longing to go there. Right? You say, well, preacher, you know, I'm enjoying my life. I am too. God's good to me. I'm enjoying life. I'm enjoying life. That doesn't mean I do not have trials. That does not mean that I do not have burdens. But I'm thankful for the life that God has given me. How about you? Can you say amen? Are you enjoying the blessings of God in your life? And yet, as good as life is, I can say in, in contrast to that gospel track that I read 30-something years ago, instead of being a no sinner lost in sin, all this in hell too, I stand before you redeemed in the blood of Jesus Christ, saved by the amazing grace of God, and I can say all this in heaven too. Going to heaven, brethren. We're going to heaven. Paul said, I want to tell you about going to heaven. He said, I went. Amen. I went to heaven. Did you, Paul? Paul, in chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians, talked about some of the lowest times in his life. He talked about the trials, and he talked about uh, uh, being beaten with stripes in verse number 24 of chapter 11. Five times received I 40 stripes, save one. 39 stripes. Thrice, in verse 25, was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. And he goes on, he talks about in verse number 27, in weariness and painfulness. He talked about the lows of his life. He even closed out this chapter about being let down uh, through a window in a basket in verse number 33. He said, you know, my life has had some low points. And we heard in Sunday school this morning that the Christian life is not all a bed of roses. It's not this prosperity gospel that's being peddled. And that's what it is. It's being peddled today. It's not that. That's not the Christian life. The Christian life has some hard places. All life has hard places. Whether you're a Christian or not, it rains on the just and the unjust alike. Life is not a bed of roses. Life has trials and hard places. But I'm thankful that in the midst of those now, I have Jesus with me. Amen. Paul said, I want you to know that that my life is not all uh, uh, on, a, on a cloud. It's not all up here. I'm not, listen, life is, is not, a, uh, not all a mountaintop experience. And so he talked about the lows. But he said, you know what? I want to tell you, I've had some high points in my life too. He said, I'm going to tell you about one of them. And he began that in chapter number 12. And he said, I, I, I come to visions and revelations. Now, in the last 10, 15, 20 years, we've heard a lot about people who say they've had a, 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 a death and afterlife experience. And they come back and they do their interviews and they, they write their books and they, 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 they have their TV spots. I find it very interesting that Paul said, I, it's unlawful for me to utter. The exact opposite of what we're hearing. Now I'm not saying that God won't roll back the veil and let a person see over yonder sometimes. I believe that there's people that God will do that. I believe he did it for Stephen. When he stood there and he looked up into heaven and he saw Jesus standing on the right hand of God. I believe God does that. He did it right here, but Paul didn't tell about it. Had to be careful about experiences though, right? Had to prove it by this book. If it doesn't line up with this book, then brethren, listen, you stick with the book. You stick with the book. Paul said, I want to tell you about a high in my life, a high point, a high time in my life. There's something that he said that really ought to to seal the deal of everything you ever hear about an experience. Now listen to me. Look at verse number one. Look at the last three words. Of the Lord. Visions, revelations. When people start talking to you about things of God, you make sure it's of the Lord. What saith the Scriptures? You see. What's God say? Because as we heard in Sunday school and as we believe here, that's final authority. What God said. And he began to tell about this, and he said, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. In verse number 2, he said, Whether in the body I cannot tell, whether out of the body I cannot tell. He said, God knoweth, such a one was called up into the third heaven. Now that leads me to my first question about heaven. It's the location question. Where is heaven? Where is heaven? You know, from the tiniest of ages, from, from little tots, when people begin to talk about heaven and hell, they get their directions right, don't they? Don't they? You know, 
heaven. Right? Where are you going when you die? Where do you want to go when you die? Yes, a little taught that. Right? You notice what Paul said there? He didn't say I was taken down. He said I was called up. Look at it again. I was caught up. He said it again in verse number four. He said, he that was caught up into paradise. He said in verse number two, he was caught up into the third heaven. Heaven's up. Now listen, there's, if there's the third heaven that Paul was called in, that means that there's number one and number two also. Right? Number one heaven, we call it the atmospheric heaven. That's where the birds fly. That's where the rain falls from. Right? It's about six or seven miles above the surface here. Heaven, you go out and you look up into the, the God's blue heaven, right? That's the first heaven. Somebody said you get there by day. You go out in the daytime, you look up, you see the first heaven. And then there's the second heaven. That's the stellar heaven. You go out at night and you see the stars and the planets. That's the stellar heaven, right? Somebody said you get there by night. But this is talking about the third heaven. You get to the first heaven by day, the second heaven by night, but you get to the third heaven by faith. Amen. Amen. No man, listen, a man can get you to the first heaven in an airplane, get you to the second heaven if you're brave enough in a rocket ship, but no man's ever going to get you to the third heaven. You listen to me now. No man is ever going to get you there. You get there based upon your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. You don't get there by ingenuity of the head like man has done in the first and second heaven. You get there by faith in your heart by what Jesus Christ has done. It's up. It's up. When you read the scripture over and over again, the Bible talks about heaven being upward. Upward. I'm going to share some scripture with you in just a moment. But I want you to write John 3 down. In John 3, write that down in your Bible somewhere. In verse 12 and 13, Jesus talks about ascending and descending descending he talked about the son of man uh descending to earth and ascending back up to heaven jesus talked about heaven being up in john 17 in verse number one when jesus prayed his high priestly prayer the bible says he lift up his eyes toward heaven lift it up you see when jesus ascended into heaven he said ye men of galilee listen that, that those men standing by why stand ye here gazing up Heaven's up, right? It's up. When God revealed to us in Isaiah, in chapter number 14, the heart of Satan, when God revealed to us what was going on in his heart, he said, I will ascend above the Most High. He talked about his, his home being in the north. I want you to take your Bible, and just for a moment, I want you to look back to the book of Kings. And we may have looked at this a few weeks ago, but I want you to see it again. 1 Kings, turn to 1 Kings chapter number 8. Would you do that? In 1 Kings chapter 8, we have the Bible telling us God wants us to know where this place, heaven, is. This is the location question. Where is heaven? Where is heaven? You say, well, I, I, uh, I don't believe there is a heaven, preacher. Well, I feel sorry for you. I do. I feel sorry for a person who doesn't believe in heaven or hell. You know, we talk a lot about people who don't believe in hell. Say, I can't believe that person doesn't believe in hell. Well, listen, there's people who don't believe in heaven either. I believe in both because this book teaches both. And I believe God made all heaven, earth, and hell. Now, hell was created for the devil and his angels. And if you go there, you'll go there as an intruder. But God will allow people to go to hell that reject Jesus Christ. In 1 Kings chapter 8, look here if you would. Look if you would in verse number 27. 1 Kings chapter 8. This is a wonderful chapter in the Word of God where King Solomon is getting ready to pray, uh, pray a prayer of dedication for the newly built temple. And as he is getting ready to pray this prayer, he begins to thank God for the covenant that he kept with his father David. And in verse number 27 of 1 Kings chapter 8, the Bible says this, as Solomon is speaking to God, he said, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house which I have built. And look at verse number 30. And hearken thou to the supplication of thy servant and of thy people Israel, when they shall pray toward this place, and hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and when thou hearest, forgive. See, heaven's the abode of God. It's the dwelling place of God. It's where God resides. You say, well, I thought God was omnipresent. Listen, God is outside of space and time and matter. Our finite minds cannot 
comprehend God. We can experience Him, but we cannot comprehend Him. So when we think of heaven, we think about the location of heaven. It's up. It's in the north. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 75 just for a moment. I want to read something to you about heaven. In Psalm 75, we'll read one more verse before we move on from this thing of location. In Psalm 75, notice what the Scripture teaches here in verse number 5. Psalm 75, verse 5 says, Lift not up your horn on high, speak not with a stiff neck, for promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. What's, what direction is left out there for you geography professors? The north. You know why? Because that is where God promotes from. Up. North. He said promotion. Look at it again. Promotion, which is exaltation, cometh neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south, but God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. The location question. Heaven's up. It's in the north. It's in the sides of the north. It's the, where the abode of God is. You go beyond our galaxy. You go beyond the furthest planet from our galaxy, Pluto. Listen, I, I read this week something that's it's just, it's, it boggles your mind, the creative works of God. I read this week Pluto was 2.7 million miles from the earth. No, you've got to go beyond that. And then you go beyond the Alpha Centauri, which has two suns and is 26 times brighter than our solar system. You have to go beyond that. And then you go beyond the polar star and beyond Vega, which is 440 times brighter than our solar system, all the way beyond the uh, Alcyone, which is 12,000 times brighter. You have to go even beyond that. It's a long way away. It's north. But now watch this. You say, well, preacher, that's so far away. But I'm glad God's not so far away. You see, the Bible tells us over and over and over again that the Lord is nigh. The Lord is nigh. Isn't it something that the abode of God was so far away and yet God in His omnipotent power moved on Stephen and allowed Stephen as God rolled back the curtain of heaven, allowed Stephen to see into heaven. Isn't that something? Heaven's a long way away. But it's not too far for God to reach down His hand and minister to me and minister to you. Heaven's a long way away, but it's not too far for God to hear you when you pray and God to hear me when I pray. It's not too far away for God to care about you and the state you're in in your life and God to care about me and the things that I go through in life. I'm glad that though God's abode is far away, that God himself is up close and personal, weren't you? See, God's made it that way, brethren. He has. Now, one day we're going to go to this place. I'm going to show you what the Bible says about it here in just a moment. Now, this is just the location question. The location question. All right? You say, man, it'd take us a long time to get there. I don't know. When that thief on the cross, listen, when he said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom, Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto thee, today thou shalt be with me in heaven. Didn't take them long to get there. 2 Corinthians 5, 8, the Bible says to be absent from the body. It's talking about you, dear believer. It's talking about me. One day, if Jesus doesn't come, and, listen, while we're alive, if Jesus doesn't rapture out the church, we're going to go by way of the grave. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Just like that, brethren. Just like that. We're going to be in God's presence. Long way away. But in the twinkling of an eye. We're going to be in his presence. The location question. Where is heaven? Well, it's north. It's the abode of God. Now, the description question. Turn, if you would, to Revelation. Revelation 21. We'll look at just a few things about heaven. I believe this might be the reason that a lot of people, people read stuff like what's in the book of the Revelation. Oh, preacher, that, that's impossible. Can I tell you nothing's impossible with God? I've seen some beautiful things that God has created upon this earth. My feet have touched some of them, but most of them I've seen with my eyes. I'm not, 
and have not been much of a traveler in my years, but I've been to many places in my mind as I've watched and I've seen pictures and I've seen videos of places of beauty upon this earth, astounding beauty. And yet the Bible tells us that we're going to a place, brethren, that is absolutely, I mean, it is gorgeous. It is peaceful. It is serene. I want to describe some things or rather let God's Word describe it to you. I think sometimes people think that heaven might be the size of Madison. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Hey, listen, have you read about this place? Did you know that, and, 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 and I'm not you know, going to get into all the geometrics of this, you could fit 15 earths in heaven. Did you hear me? 15 earths in heaven in this new Jerusalem. When you look at the, the cubic footage of this place, it's huge. I don't know. I, I, I'm a stats man, but I haven't done all the, you know, the, the math and the work. But they say that somewhere between 30 and 35, maybe 40 billion people since the dawn of time ha has, that has walked this earth. I don't know. Okay, I don't know that. I know there's, there's, there's what, roughly 6, 7 billion now. But they say since the dawn of time, 30, 35, 40 billion people. Can I tell you, when you do the math and you look at what the Scripture gives us, the size of his 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles high, all right? You know, how, you, know, you know how much cubic footage that, that is? Listen carefully now. I'm talking to a place, it's big. Okay, heaven's big. Heaven's not like your closet. Get that out of your mind. Get that out of your mind. You say, well, uh, you know, not many people going to heaven. Well, the Bible says there's a great multitude there. Now, in comparison, comparatively speaking, I know what Jesus said. Straight is the gate, narrow is the way, and few there be, comparatively speaking. But when you turn over to the book of the Revelation, you hear where John said there, I, I looked and I saw a great multitude, thousands times, thousands and thousands, brethren. So get this out of your mind now that, well, we're just going to go over on the backside of a mountain somewhere and just, just, I guess we'll just live in a little cabin in heaven. Oh, get that out of your mind. That's not so. No wonder folks don't want to go there. Listen to some so-called Christian describe it. You read the Word of God, brethren, it's something. It's something. 2,700,000,000 cubic feet. That's big. Do the math. Look at the size of this place. Look at it in Revelation 20, 21. Look at verse number 15. It says, And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. And the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with a reed 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height are all of it are equal. And he said he measured the wall thereof in 144 cubits according to the measure of a man. That is, of the angel. So you, you take this place and you see all that, the, 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 the vastness of it, the size of heaven. Don't you get in your mind now, don't you let some liberal tell you, well, you know, if there is such a place, it's some little remote place like a little island stowed away on the backside. That's not what this book teaches. This book teaches it's a huge place. Brethren, we're going to a big, beautiful place, heaven. Heaven. Notice what else it says. Not just the size of it, but look at the structure. Look at verse 18. The building, it begins to talk about in verse 18 of Revelation 21, the building, the structure of this city. He talked about the building of the wall of Jasper. Then look at verse number 19. He talked about the foundations of the wall. And he began to name the foundations. Look at verse number 21. He talks about the gates. We're talking about the, the, the structure of this place where we're going. The description, it's real. Brethren, heaven is real. So that, that doesn't excite me. Well, it ought to. If you're saved, that ought to excite you. That ought to get you excited. God has built such a place for his people. Then if you'll look down in verse number 21, not only does it mention the gates, but it said the street in the latter part of verse number 21, the street of the city. Now, it didn't say streets. The street of the city was of pure gold. The structure of this building, it's not only big, the structure of it, brethren, it's forever. We're, we're not going to go to this place for a, a, a year, ten, a hundred, a thousand. Brethren, we're going here forever. 
And we need to get that fixed in our minds. Because I fear that sometimes we, we get this thing, well, you know, we get our 70 and then it's done. Hey, I'm living forever. I'm living forever. Why don't we start living like we're living forever, brethren? Amen. We get so involved in this world and we get so bogged down by the things of this world and the cares of this world that we lose sight of the fact that God has built us a place and we're going to heaven. We're going to heaven. All because of what Jesus has done for us. You know, if this place had all of this and Jesus wasn't there, I don't know that it would really be worth staying there forever. I kind of like to see it. I'll be honest with you. I've heard people say, well, if it's, if it's that and Jesus is not there, I don't want to go. Well, I don't know. I, I, I still kind of like to see it with my eyes. I'll just be honest with you. Because the Bible said, I have not seen, neither, uh, you know, has ear heard, neither did it through the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them which love him. But the Spirit of God's revealed them to us right here in his book. He has. The location. The description. See, it's not only all this beauty. Look at it. It talks about this, the, the, the size, the structure. Look at the sites. I'm going to just give you a few things. I'm just trying to whet your appetite a little bit. Look at it now. Look at verse number 18. The wall of Jasper. Look at verse number 19. It's talking about the foundation of precious stones. It mentions Jasper. It mentions sapphire. It mentions emerald. It mentions sardis. It mentions chrysolite, beryl, topaz. Can you imagine the brilliancy of the colors in this wonderful place that we're going? You know, there are people who pay boatloads of money to ride trains and, and, and take excursions to see the foliage in the fall. And I'm not saying they shouldn't. But brethren, we're going to a place that that is going to pale in comparison to what we're going to see when we get to heaven. The, the, the explosion of, of the many colors that God has in this place. Not just the colors, but look what the Bible says. There will be gates of pearl. Could you imagine seeing these huge gates of just pearl? Street of gold. It mentions in verse number 22, look at chapter 22. I said verse 22, but look at chapter 22. There's going to be a, a river of water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God. You know, I don't know too many things that are more relaxing than to sit by a babbling brook. Here John talked about this crystal clear river. Well, that's going to be a sight. You say, preacher, you talk, to, you talk as if you're going to see that one day. I am. I am. I'm going to this place, brethren. I'm excited about going to heaven. Talks about the crystal, the crystal clear river. Then it speaks in verse number 2. It talks about the tree of life. And it talks about fruit all the things that are going to be there, the scenery. John, John put it this way. Look at verse number 8 of chapter 22. He said, And I, John, saw these things and heard them. What's John saying? You know, up the road here in Pennsylvania, they have sight and sound. That's what he said. He said, I'm at sight and sound times a billion. Amen. He said, I saw in verse number 8 these things, and I heard them. John said, I am just overwhelmed by this sight and sound. Brethren, I'm telling you. Heaven is a wonderful place. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's magnificent for all that it has to offer. But notice what the Bible also tells us about the description of heaven. It's not only what's there, it's who's there. Jesus is there. The Bible says that, that the Lamb of God is there, that there'll be no need for the Son. That the glory of God and the Lamb themselves will light that city. Oh, brother, can I tell you that one day we're going to see Jesus Christ face to face? We are. You say, preacher, I, I hope when I get to heaven I'll know you. I'm going to be talking about that when we talk about the population of heaven. That won't be today. I don't know, I don't know about these people who say, well, you know, when we get to heaven, we won't know one another. Well, who wants to go to a, bunch of, a place with a bunch of strangers? We will know one another when we get to heaven. Paul said, listen, when I get there, he said, right now, he said, I, 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 I know in part, but one day I'm going to know even also as I'm known. Isn't that what he said in 1 Corinthians? Amen. That's what he said. Can I tell you, people in heaven uh, obviously know some of the things that's going on here on earth. Because every time somebody gets saved, there's rejoicing in heaven. You say, well, that's the angels. No, that, that's not what the Bible said. Jesus said in the presence of angels, there's rejoicing. 
in heaven. They know when sinners get saved. In the afterlife, folks know some things that are going on this earth. You say, do they, preacher? Well, I, I, the rich man knew that his brethren wasn't saved. Praying for somebody to go by and tell them. Isn't that right, brother? That was an afterlife. Listen to me. Don't you, don't you take, don't you listen to some of these, these authors that, that don't believe this book. And they're giving you half stuff, causing you to lose your faith and your joy and your excitement about what it is to be a Christian. We've, listen, we, we've got it good, brethren. We have the Word of God. We have the Spirit of God. We, we get to fellowship with the people of God. We get to come to the house of God. We get to worship the one true and living God. All this in heaven too. We're going to heaven. We're going to heaven. We all get excited about that. Well, I hope Donald Trump wins in 2020. Well, if we're still around and he runs, I hope, I hope he does too. But if we're not, I'm going to heaven. Well, what if so-and-so? I'm going to heaven. You're saved, you're going to heaven. We need to get excited about this place called heaven. We ought to get excited about it. The location of it. The description of it. Let me give you one more thing about the description, then I'll move to my final point, and I want to call on you that maybe that are not saved, and you're not going there. I want to help you to get there. You say, can you help me get there? I'm going to tell you how. But you'll have to make the choice. All right? Now listen carefully. Heaven's known for a lot of things as I read the Scripture here. But there's some things it's not known for that's just as popular and good for things that it is known for. We call those the no mores. Look in Revelation 21. Look at verse number 4. Revelation 21, verse number 4, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death. You know, we've had to lay to rest some mighty fine Christians out of our congregation over the years. We sure have. You've had to stand at the graveside of someone you love dearly. You've had to bid them farewell. Tell them, I'll see you in the morning. I'll see you in the morning. Praise God, when we get here, there'll be no more death. The Bible says no more death. Look at it now, verse number four, neither sorrow. Some of you this morning, though you're, you got up and you got yourself ready and you came to church, you ha you're, you're bearing a heavy burden. There's sorrow and heartache in your life. One day, we're going to lay our burdens down, brethren. We're going to lay these burdens down and we'll sorrow no more. No more. It's a reality. It's a reality. No more death, no more sorrow, nor cry. No more crying. From hurt, heartache, disappointment. One day, no more crying. It, it goes on to say, neither shall there be any more pain. Some of you live with pain every day of your life. Some of you have loved ones. They live with pain every day of their life, and you help them manage through that time. Brethren, we're going to a place where there'll be no more pain. The Bible says also, if you'll look over in verse number 27 of chapter number 21, look at verse 27, and it says, There shall be no, uh, no wise enter into that thing anything that defileth, neither work uh, whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie. You know what that's saying? You see it there? Chapter 21, verse 27. We're going to a place where there'll be no more sin. Well, won't that be wonderful? Amen. I hate to let the Lord down, don't you? I don't want to let the Lord down. But I do. But one day, I'll never let Him down again. Never. I hate when I give in to the flesh and I don't walk in the Spirit because I want to please God with my life. One day, I'll never have to deal with that again never why because i'm going to heaven and i'm excited about it i am you say well you seem sad oh i'm not i'm only sad that i'm not already there <laughs> amen you know i can't wait to get to heaven why you say that preacher but well, i enjoy my life here but brethren i've read about what's to come i've read about what's to come look at verse number three of chapter 22 Chapter 22, verse 3 of the book of the Revelation says, There shall be no more curse. 
Verse number 5 says, There shall be no more night. And they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. I tell you, it's a wonderful place we're going to called heaven. It really is. Now, there's two things I'm going to talk to you in another message, okay? And that's occupation. You say, well, when we get to heaven, we're just going to kind of strum a golden harp and float around on a, cr- on a cloud. You've been watching too much Disney. You need to read this book. The Bible says we'll serve him, but it also says in Revelation 22, look at verse number 5. Well, let me, let me back that. Look at verse number 3 of Revelation 22. Look at the very last part of that. And his servants shall serve him. It's going to be wonderful to serve God in perfection. But don't you get mixed up now. That's not all we're going to do in heaven. Look in chapter 5. Look at the latter part of verse number 5. And they shall reign. We're not only going to serve, we're going to reign. So I'm going to talk to you about occupation in heaven in a, in a message. And then I mentioned to you population. All right? We'll talk about that. What's heaven going to be populated with? Well, that's how I want to close the service today. We talked about heaven's location. And I just skimmed the surface. The Bible has a lot to say about where heaven is. All right? It's north. But I want to tell you what God said. God said, I'm going to bring a part of heaven. Now listen to me carefully. That I have prepared for my people and I'm going to suspend it. He said, I'm going to send it down. He said, did God say that? Well, let's see here. Look, if you would, in Revelation 21, verse number 2. And I, John, saw the holy city. Now, this place that we're going to is called by a lot of great names. I just want you to underline them quickly now, okay? I wish I had time to go in every one of them, but I don't, but you can. Look quickly. Chapter number 21, verse number 2, is called the holy city. Chapter 21, verse 2, it's called the new Jerusalem. Chapter 21, verse number 2, it's called like a bride adorned for her husband. It speaks of the beauty and the purity of heaven. Look, if you would, in chapter number 21, verse number 10. It says, And he carried me away in the Spirit to a a great and high mountain and showed me, look at this, that great city. It's called that great city. And, And it's also called the Holy Jerusalem. So not only is it the New Jerusalem, it's the Holy Jerusalem. I'm telling you, this place is wonderful. Jesus called it his Father's house. He said, there's many mansions. You say, well, now, is that that up north? It is now, but God's going to send it south. All good things eventually come south. (laughs) Relax, don't get all... (laughs) Some folks get their feathers riled up, right? Look what the Bible said here in chapter 21, verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city in New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. So it's in heaven now. But God's going to suspend it between heaven and earth. It's going to come down out of heaven. And we're going there. You say, preacher, do you really believe that? Listen, I wish I could open up my heart so you could see that every bit of it's filled with yes. You better believe I believe it because God said it. I believe everything this book teaches. I'm going to this place. I'm going to step foot on these streets. I am. I'm going to view the gates, the, the, the foundation, the walls, I, the, the crystal clear river, I, the throne of God. I'm going to see it all, brethren. I'm going to see it all. So, well, I hope we know each other there. Well, I don't know. The disciples knew Moses and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration. Never seen them before in their life. We're not only going to know people that we know, we're going to know people we didn't know. Somebody say amen with me now. Just study the Bible, brethren. It's in the book. It's in the book. You think, you think that rich man or Lazarus ever saw Abraham? They knew who he was. He was calling them out, Father Abraham. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody's going to have to introduce you to Paul. Hey, man, listen to me. I'm telling you what this book teaches. You think when it was on the Mount of Transfiguration that you think Peter, James, and John knew who Elijah and Moses were? You think they ever saw them? They called them by their name. They knew who they were. They knew who they were. We're going to know each other in heaven. Nobody's going to have to introduce you to the disciples, the patriarchs. Certainly no one's going to have to introduce you or I to Jesus. It's not going to happen. See, we try, to, we try to imagine the afterlife by this life. That's where we mess up. That's where we mess up. I'm going to close with this, the location question. All right? Where is heaven? The description question. What's heaven look like? The preparation question. What must I do? How should I prepare to make it to this place? Well, the Bible speaks about citizenship in heaven. 
So I have you to know I'm an American citizen. That's not going to get you to heaven. Oh, but America is a Christian country. Uh, that's debatable. Not much debatable anymore. Pretty much the handwriting's on the wall. It was founded on Christian principles. But you don't go to heaven by being an American. I'm a Baptist. You, know, you don't go to heaven not only by your national affiliation, but you don't go to heaven by a religious affiliation either. You don't go to heaven for being a Baptist. Listen to me now. Well, I'm a freeman. You don't go to heaven by your, your family name. No, Jesus said this in Luke 10, 20. He said, when the disciples came back, they had cast out devils. He said, don't rejoice because the devils are subject unto you in my name, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Now, how are you going to get that done? How are you going to get your name? How are you going to become a citizen of heaven? You must be born again. Just being born is not going to get you there. It's not. Actually, if you just have one birth, I'm sorry to have to report to you today, but I've got to be honest. And I have to tell you, if you've only been born once, you will die in your sin and go to hell. Now, I don't want you to do that, and God doesn't want you to do that. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants you to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. See, God sent His Son to die for our sin. And He did die. Jesus Christ came, He lived, He died. He was buried, He rose again from the grave the third day. And if you will place your faith, which is a gift from God, in His finished work, Repent of your sin and say, God, I'm sorry that I've sinned against you. I'm sorry that I've, I've sinned, and I want to ask you to forgive me and to come into my heart. If you'll, if you'll repent and ask Christ to be your Savior, the Bible says you can be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's how you make your reservation. That's how you make your preparation to get to this place called heaven. Say, well, I think I'm just going to hold off and how many of you have ever been traveling and thought, well, you know what, we didn't make a reservation. I'll just wait until I get there, and, and then I'll make it when I get there. You know, I don't know too many people travel that way, but there are still some folks who do that kind of stuff, Brother Corey. We're going to live life on the edge. We'll just, you know, we're going to be sporadic, and we're just going to drive till we get tired, then we're going to pull over and make our reservation. Listen, if you think you're going to wait till you get to the, to the place to make your reservation, you've sadly mistaken You need to make your reservation before you start on that trip. Okay? Let's all stand to our feet. Heaven. It's a wonderful place. It's a wonderful place. I'm going. All God's children are going. Listen, if you're saved, you say, well, we're all God's children. Oh, no, 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 no. We're all God's creation. I didn't say all God's creation is going. I said all God's children are going. And we're children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. All right? If you're saved, you're going to heaven. If you're not, you're not. But you can. I'm going to ask the pianist to come. I have two simple questions today. Number one, for those that are saved, are you really excited about going to heaven? Now, how are we going to expect other people to get excited and want what we have and want to go where we're going, heaven, if we're not excited about it. I'm telling you, brethren, we need to get excited. With joy unspeakable and full of glory, we get to go to heaven. It's a wonderful thing. We get to go to heaven. We need to start living like we're going there too. We do. And so I want you to contemplate that question. Am I excited about going to heaven? Be honest with yourself. This is not about me and you. It's not. It's about you and God and your excitement about what He's done for you and what He's prepared for you and where He's going to take you when you leave this life. And then for someone that may be here this morning that's never been saved, would you like to prepare to go to heaven? Would you like to know Jesus as your personal Savior? Would you come to Him today and humbly bow in repentance to Him and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The Bible says that if you will do that, that is making preparation to go to this place called heaven.
you can leave here not only a changed man, a changed woman, but with a different destination when you leave this life. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. The piano is going to begin to play. Two questions right to the heart.